Hi, it's Jeff here from VIP Vision. One of the most common situations that people find themselves in on new installations is uh, where they've got IP cameras such as these two here and they've got them running through either directly to a network video recorder or into a switch then running into a network video recorder or then perhaps into running into another VMS. Um, but what they've run into is that they've, they've got their IP cameras are not connecting to the recorder or they're only connecting intermittently. So just to give you an indication of what we've, we've got here in this scenario, so we've got two IP cameras running into through two 30 meter patch cables running into a network switch. That network switch is then running into a network video recorder. Now if I switch across to our network video recorder now, you'll see that unfortunately we have no connection on either one of our devices right now. So Obviously, in this, in this situation, the first thing to rule out is your IP addressing. So anything that's, that's on a, not a physical layer thing, there's a, it's a virtual layer thing. So, you know, IPs and, uh, you know, if you're running VLANs or any other, anything other than low-level hardware stuff, once you've ruled all of that out, the next thing to do is to step to hardware and try and work out what might be wrong there. So, as I mentioned, I've got my two cameras here running through cables. Uh, into a switch and then into a network video recorder. Now any of these things could be at fault. However, in our experience, the most likely thing to be at fault here is your cabling. Um, now a lot of people at first won't want to admit that because it's, it's a very difficult thing to fix, a very difficult thing to correct if it is, is the issue, but honestly that's the best place to start um, simplifying. So fault finding is all about simplifying, okay? So we want to get, get down to the point where we've got um, as little as possible that could be causing an issue so that we can then successively approximate and work out what our issue is. So the first thing that I'm going to do in this scenario here is I'm going to disconnect my camera and connect it using a short patch lead instead. Now obviously this is a little little more involved if you're actually doing this in an installation environment because I would have to remove this camera, unmount it, take it down, put it close to the recorder or into a network switch and plug the camera in. So I'm going to do that just to uh, verify that it's not a cable thing. So now I'm going to wait for that to come back up and uh, we'll just see if it, if it is our cable thing. Um, one of the, I guess during this time while we're waiting that, for that to boot, we can discuss a couple of the things that cables usually go wrong with cabling if it is the cabling. So the first, the first thing is distance. So people tend to push the 100 meter boundary of um, Ethernet over cable or Ethernet over copper I should say um, quite a bit. So really if you're over 100 meters you're pretty much on your own whether you're using Cat5 or Cat6 cable obviously there's, there's a possibility of Cat5 uh, or Cat6 cable I should say going further than Cat5 cable. Um, however the spec says 100 meters so you should really stick to 100 meters if you do need to exceed a 100 meter boundary, there are a couple of ways to do that. So the first of which is just to stick a networking switch in the middle somewhere. So this is a power over ethernet networking switch. Um, I'll switch across to another camera here. So, you know, I would feed, feed my um, feed into one of these ports, probably the uplink port, and then I would feed out to my cameras. Um, obviously, this may not work in all scenarios because I do need to still supply power to this unit here. You can see, oops, flip around the right way. You can see that I do need supply or DC 53 volts, which will come from an AC adapter. So that's not always the best way to do it. So there are other ways that we can do this as well. We could use something like a power over ethernet extender, such as this one here. Now, if I flip back across, you'll see that on this product, we have an in, on the in, on this side, I should say. That in, then, that's where our, our, we're coming from, our network video recorder, it feeds in here, and then we're feeding back out to a camera or out to another extender, or both. We can go to a camera and another extender if we wanted to. So this needs to go before the 100 meter mark and we'll give you another 100 meters, the same way that a switch would. So the third third thing that we can actually do if we are running over, over a limit is um, actually on this switch here um, that, that I'm showing you here at the moment. Now this is a our A series VIP vision switch, but if I, I'll jump back across here. So because this is plugged in, it's actually a little bit difficult to show you, but 
if you do see the right this this switch on the side here you'll have you'll see it'll say default and extend so this network switch here can actually force our cables or our cameras to run in 10 megabit mode instead of 100 megabit mode now obviously that's no good for an uplink but so if i was running to more than one camera but if i'm only running to a single camera 10 megabit is probably more than enough now the 10 megabits running 10 megabits over um, a cat 5 or cat 6 cable will actually get you closer to 250 meters instead of 100 meters so Keep that in mind, that's, that's another possibility. We can go down that route. However, uh, this is only for running a single camera. And keep in mind that you know, you're only gonna wanna be using maybe low megapixel count and low bitrate cameras here. We're not talking something, like we're not gonna wanna be sticking a, a 12 megapixel camera on the other end of it, running at full steam. So I'll just put that switch back down here now. But if we just wanna now jump across, um, we'll just jump across here and just see if that did fix our there you go so we've got one camera up now so all we did is we dis we pulled down the camera and we plugged in our cable our short patch cable here and eliminated our 30 meter cable here that we'd run now like i said before this would normally be in the walls or, or run across the building so uh, you know We've unfortunately decided that the cable is actually the issue here rather than the camera. Um, however, like I said, it's, it's the most likely thing to happen. Now, what do we do now? Well, we have to kind of determine why, why this cable might've been the problem. As I said before, it could be because we've been a bit overzealous on our length and we've exceeded hundred meters. Maybe we've run at 120 meters and uh, it's just not working for us. So we'll have to go back and use one of those other methods to overcome that. Um, however, the other two things that are possible and probably even more likely because you know, most people know the 100 meter limitation uh, one it could be that you've actually got a broken cable or a broken pair inside um, our cable the second thing could be a missed termination so what a lot of people will do is they'll actually use something like this so this is a a, a network tester now i'll flip across the other camera so you can get a closer look now many people will have seen these essentially what we've got if I separate this, uh, we have on one side, we have our transmitter and on the second side, we have our receiver. Now, what we want to see is all of the lights lighting up in sequence as they flash down the side here to verify that all of our pairs are joined. We have a good continuity between uh, point A, so our transmitter side and point B. That means that we've got no breaks and we can rule out any breaks in the cable. So that's, that's the first thing that we want to check. So I'm going to plug that into my cable here. And I'll slide this back in here. Obviously this would normally be remote to us. So I would put this on the NVR side and this on the camera side. Um, but since I have the cable in front of me, I'll just join this back together for ease of use. And I'll plug in the other side. So taking a look at that there. So we've got those two connected and I'm going to switch it on. So there you go, you can see that we've got everything running properly. Now this is an unshielded cable, which is why you'll see that the shield light won't light up, but everything else is working as we would expect it. So from that, we can deduce that there are no breaks in this cable, which is a good thing. So that's, that's a good start. However, it still doesn't work for us. So we have to determine why that's the case. Now, it's important to note, these cable testers are only good to determine whether you've got a, a broken pair or possibly a shorted pair. They're no good, they don't do any data integrity checking. Um, there's a hint for this actually on the back of the, this particular tester. It says, test it for cable continuity only. So what that basically means is this doesn't do any, any data verification okay so the next thing that we actually need to check um, is we, you know, we need to need to make sure that we don't just blindly take the results of this test we need to check to make sure our cable is actually terminated correctly okay so when I say terminated correctly what I mean is that the cables or the pairs inside the cable are actually in the correct order 
Now there's a very specific order for this. Um, the standards are called uh, 568 or T568. Um, and we need to be sure that we've got them in the correct order. Now there's two ways that we can do this. We can do this either, either using 568A or 568B. And I'm gonna switch across just to show you what that looks like now. So you'll see from here, um, we have 568A as our wiring standard. This is looking from the pin side up. Okay, so just to show you, so this is, this is looking from the pins, and so we're looking into the pins in these diagrams. So what we need to verify is that our cable is run in green, white, green, orange, white, blue, blue, white, orange, brown, white, brown on both sides, or orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green, brown, white, brown on both sides. So it doesn't matter which one of these you pick, um, as long as you use the same on both ends of the cable, I would usually suggest that you use A just because it's more common, um, but B will work just as well. Okay, the critical thing here is that we match this, either one of these exactly, because if we don't, what we'll find is we'll get a phenomenon uh, happening known as uh, split pairs. So when I say split pairs, I mean, if you've taken a look inside a Cat5 or Cat6 cable, which you would have if you were terminating them, you'll see that we actually have four separate pairs of wires. We've got our green pair, our blue pair, our orange pair, and our brown pair. Now, it's very important that these stay together as a pair um, so when we're, for instance, we've got a, a transmit pair and a receive pair on, on 100 megabit ethernet, our transmit pair is our green pair in 568A, and our receive pair is our orange pair on 568A. We need to make sure that both of these stay together because ethernet uses a technology called differential signaling, and uh, suffice to say that they need to stay together for differential signaling to work properly. So, as I mentioned, make sure that the cables are correct. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna actually verify this cable here is correct. So I've actually got something completely different on this cable. I have brown, brown, white, brown, blue, white, blue, orange, white, orange, green, white, green. Now, while it's the same on both sides of the cable, it's actually not going to work for us because what we've done, as I mentioned before, is we have, we've split pairs. So our transmit pair um, is no longer, or our transmit pair is actually a brown pair in this case, but our, our receive pair has been split across the orange and blue um, pairs. So that stuffs with our differential signaling and that's gonna cause us issues. So from there, we can basically deduce that the problem with this cable is not a break in the cable, we've used, we've used our test to determine that. It's not a short in the cable, again, we've used our test to determine that. However, it is a mis-termination on these cables. So what we need to do then is re-terminate this cable and try again. So I just happen to have another cable here which is terminated correctly to 568A. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna pretend now that I've re-terminated this cable and I'm gonna plug it in unplug my patch lead like so okay so now what we'll do is this will we'll just wait for this to to reconnect and there you go we have reconnected as you can see Wave my arm in front. So now, so all that would have been required on this particular cable would have been to re-terminate it. It's very important that you use those standards as I mentioned earlier. You can't just wire the cables in any, any which way because you will end up splitting pairs and that will cause us issues. Um, hopefully you've gotten something out of this video. So as I, as, as I mentioned before, we've gone over some of the things that could be a problem with regards to um, you know, fault finding, how it's usually cables and how, how to use a cable tester correctly to verify that it's not a short or an open wire, um, and then to verify that the pinout on the cable is correct. Thanks for listening. This has been Jeff from, Jeff from VIP Vision. Uh, if you've got any questions about this, feel free to leave a comment below. Um, if you'd like, like to see any other videos like this or, or anything else, please again leave a comment below. Um, and yeah, thanks for watching.